Good morning, church. I'm Ben Peterson. I'm the youth leader here at Grant. Thank you for watching this morning. There's a couple things that I'd like to share with you. Uh, the first thing is if you're a senior graduating in June, we'd like to honor you. We'd like it if you'd send us a picture of yourself and, and let us know what degree you have and the school you, you graduated from and let us know your plans for this summer. If you're a youth, we still have stuff going on. Um, we actually, we have devotionals every week, one on Sunday and one on Tuesday night. Um, so if you haven't seen those, go check them out. They're on our youth Facebook page. Um, anyway, we're about to get service started. Good morning. Uh, we're so excited to be back with you guys. Um, for those of you that don't know, Sprummer is happening right now, our college retreat, and they have their last session tonight. So uh, thank you for all of those of you who have been praying. Um, we're super excited to hear what God has been doing at Sprummer this weekend. Um, we're going to get started with worship now. I will 
follow you love I love how you serve I'll serve if this life I lose I will follow you yeah I will follow you so good to be um, worshiping together. We're going to introduce a new song to you this morning. It's called Good Grace. Um, and I was reflecting back this week on what Jason had shared with us one of the first weeks that we were doing church like this um, during quarantine. And he had shared um, that sometimes we sing uh, songs to encourage one another, to remind each other of the faithfulness of God. And uh, this next song that we're going to sing is the perfect song for that. Um, it reminds us of God's faithfulness and how uh, we can be dwelling on those things in the midst of difficult circumstances and uh, quarantine has certainly been difficult um, in times um, and so hopefully this song can be an encouragement to you this morning your eyes on this one truth God is madly in love with you so take courage hold on be strong remember where our help comes from Don't fear no evil Fix your eyes on this one truth God is madly in love with you So take courage, hold on, be strong Remember where our help comes from Oh go up as the walls come down all creation everything with breath repeat the sound all his children clean hands pure hearts good grace good god his name is jesus swing wide all you heavens let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Jesus, our redemption. 
our salvation it's in his blood jesus light of heaven friend forever his kingdom come and god as we gather even remotely um, this morning god we remember that you your son Jesus is our great high priest who is able to sympathize with us in our need. He experienced temptation, he experienced suffering, and he experienced aloneness, God. And we know that Jesus is able to bear all of that. He bore it on the cross. God, we thank you for Jesus. And we thank you that you, you loved us to that extent that you would send your son. We praise you for that and we pray this in your son's name, amen. Good morning. Thanks for joining us again today um, online, wherever you may be. I'm thankful that uh, we're able to gather in this way. If you don't know me, I'm the lead pastor here at Grant Avenue. My name is Brian, and I'm thankful that I get to share with you today the Word of God. Um, we are in the middle of a college retreat or conference. We call it Sprummer. That's spring and summer smashed together. Sprummer. Um, they have been gathering online Friday nights, Saturday night, and we have one more session going on again tonight at 7 o'clock. Uh, so... Um, Thank you for praying. Would you continue to pray that God will do and work um, in amazing ways uh, in students' lives? I'm so thankful that we have technology and that we have people even that are able to put it together in such a way that we can minister um, to one another even when we're not able to meet physically together. So thanks for praying. Uh, God has been doing great things, and I'm confident that in the weeks to follow, we're going to hear stories of how God used um, this time um, to bring glory to his name. With that said, would you get out your Bible and go to Psalm chapter 19? That's where we're going to be today. Um, we're in the second week of a new series that we started. It's called Habits, Small Practices, Big Results. Um, we are talking about spiritual disciplines, um, these activities, habits, practices that we can implement in our life that will help us to grow spiritually. And so over the next couple of weeks, we're going to pick a different discipline each week and, and talk about it and think about just practically what it might mean for our lives so that we could grow and know Jesus in even more personal ways, that we would be better disciples. And I want to share with you today a habit that I saw modeled for me by a friend of mine. And if you've been around Grand Avenue for a while, then you actually probably know him better than I do. His name was Chester. He passed away a couple years ago in a boating accident up at Detroit Lake. Um, but if you knew Chester well, I think you would agree with me when I say this. Um, he wasn't like you and me. He was better. He never graduated high school. In fact, as a child, he never learned to read or to write. Um, he... Uh, Spent many years actually working here at the church for the preschool. Every day as the children would leave, he would come in and he would wipe down the tables. He would clean the bathrooms. He would uh, vacuum the floors. Um, and so I got to see him on a regular basis. It was actually later in life that he did learn to read or write. He taught himself how to do that. Here's how he did it. He would actually take his Bible and lay it out in front of him, and he would take a blank notebook, and he, with his pencil, would begin to copy word for word from the Bible onto his notebook, beginning in Genesis. He would write the word Genesis. In each verse, he would number Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, and he would write it down, in the beginning. God created, God created, he would write and he would fill page after page of notebook. He went through the entire Bible many different times, different versions every time, copying the word of God over. And as a result, he learned how to read. He learned how to write. He taught himself that. 
<laughs> if you knew Chester well, you knew his daily routine. He'd get up in the morning and he'd spend an hour or two, maybe even longer, copying over. It was a slow process for him. And then he'd go to work, go run errands, do other things in town, and he'd return home. And again, he would sit and he'd begin to copy over uh, the Bible onto his notebook. One time I gave him, as a gift, a box of number two pencils. You would have thought that he had just won the lottery. He was so excited because he burned through pencils. One time he brought into me a box that he had of all of his used pencils, all the way, sharpened all the way down to just that eraser that he would use to copy it over. After he passed away, he was into the New Testament, um, copying uh, the NIV is what he was doing. And uh, his notebooks uh, were brought into the office and left with us here at the church. Every once in a while, I go and flip through them while I decided I wanted to bring them today for you to see. Uh, here they are. The, um, each one of these notebooks, the, the front and back of each page is filled with the Word of God. You can count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different books, uh, notebooks that are filled with the Word of God, starting in Genesis, getting all the way in to the New Testaments. Um, it was a daily occurrence, like I said, that he would stop by my office, and every time that he would stop by, he would share with me where he was in the Bible. You could just track along with him. Are you still in Genesis? Are you on to Exodus now? Are you still in Psalms? He was in Psalms for a couple months <laughs> working through that. But every time he'd stop by, he'd tell me not just what he was reading, but what he was learning and how it was changing his life. And as I was thinking about habits in our lives, you know, there can be a habit in your life of just opening up the Bible and reading it. That's a good habit. But it's a whole nother story when we let the Bible actually get into us. What habits could we have in our life that would allow the Bible to actually begin to change us when I think of Chester, I think of a man who was changed by the habits of reading the word of God and letting the word of God get in to him. He was kind. He was grateful. He was a servant. He was humble. He was loving. He knew Jesus personally. Just one conversation with him, you would know that. The guy knew how to pray. He learned how to pray from the word of God, and he prayed. Every time I talked to him, he would share what he was reading, and he would tell me bullet point specific ways in which he was praying for me. And so today, I want to give us just one simple point an overarching habit here, and we'll come back at the end, and I want to give us some specific things we could work on this next week. But let's start here. I want us to get into the Bible and let the Bible get in to you. And so today I want to read from Psalm chapter 19, just two verses, verse 7 and 8, where we see a description of what the Word of God, the power of the Bible, can do in your life. And in honor of Chester, uh, I have found in his notebooks, um, this, this notebook is numbered uh, number five, and this is Psalm chapter 19, verse seven and eight. He was copying from the NIV, so that's what I will read from today, but let me read to you uh, this. You can read along. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Now, I don't know if you caught it in that passage, but there are four descriptions given of the word of God, four statements, and all four statements follow the same exact pattern. We see a synonym for the word of God. Did you catch it there? I'm now looking at my version, the ESV. Verse 7, the law, testimony, precepts, and commandment. Those are all synonyms for the word of God. And that is followed by a description of the word of God. They are perfect, sure, right, and pure. And then it ends, the statement, every, all four statements end with a result of what will be true, reviving the soul, making wise the simple, rejoicing the heart, enlightening the eyes, a synonym, a description, and a result. So let me just rather quickly walk through all four of these. 
And what you'll see is this, is this is what happens when we get into the Bible, but then I want to begin to process what happens when the Bible actually gets in to us. So here's the first Verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. So I said it this way, the Bible is perfect, therefore it revives our soul. The word that's used there, the synonym for Bible is the law. The Hebrew word there is Torah, or you could say instructions. It's the first five books of the Old Testament. It's translated law, but don't let that throw you off because the Bible is not just a list of do's and don'ts, but really the Torah was a roadmap to how to really live life. God was the designer of life. He created it and he gives us the law to say, this is how life is best lived. Think of a roadmap that might take you somewhere. That's what the Torah would be. And it's described, described as being perfect. That word perfect means, uh, it's a word of comprehensiveness or completeness. Being perfect means being so complete as to cover every aspect of life. The word of God is applicable to every area of your life. It lacks nothing. Chuck Swindoll in one of his books comments on a Russian dictionary uh, that was published uh, many years ago um, where the the word Bible is defined in the dictionary. Let me read to you this definition. It's translated over to English from this Russian dictionary of the word Bible. Bible, a collection of fantastic legends without scientific support. It's full of dark hints, historical mistakes, and contradictions. It serves as a factor for gaining power and subjugating unknown nations. Well, that's not an accurate definition. <laughs> Certainly not accurate when it comes to David, because David says the law of the Lord is perfect. It's all-encompassing. It applies to every aspect of life. But then there's a promise, a result that will happen, reviving the soul. That word revive means to restore, refresh. It means to transform. I think of on a hot summer day when you jump into a nice cool pool, you're refreshed. Or drinking hot chocolate when you've been out in the cold snow. Or maybe all day when you've been working outside and you're exhausted and you come home and sit down on the couch and just kind of relax and begin to regroup. You're refreshed. Or me in the morning when I wake up and I got to have that first cup of coffee just kind of restores me and gets me going again. But what David said here, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. And so a cool pool or a cup of hot chocolate or the, the sofa after a long day or coffee in the morning, those are all good for maybe reviving the body. But when your soul needs refreshed, when your soul needs to restored, where do we go? David says the word of God. It's perfect for that, for reviving the soul. Look at the next statement that's made. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. I said it this way. The Bible is trustworthy, therefore it makes us wise. The ESV said that its testimony is sure. The version I read earlier, NIV from Chester's writing, said trustworthy. God's testimony is sure. It is a trustworthy statement. And testimony is important is important in the court of law, isn't it? Truth is important. Lies are destructive. And we're told here is that the, the testimony of God, it is trustworthy, meaning that it is accurate. When we're told that the, the Red Sea parted, it is true. When we're told that Jesus died and rose again, it's accurate, it is trustworthy. When we're told that there was another man in the fiery furnace, we know that it is true and it is accurate. But it's not just trustworthy in its accuracy, it is trustworthy in its relevancy. It's relevant to your life today. That's why it says, here's the, the promise, the result, making wise the simple. You know that word simple? It, it means like to, to be gullible. Uh, it literally means an open door. It's someone who has an open door to anything. Who wants to be gullible? Proverbs 14, 15, the simple believes anything. <laughs> One who is gullible will believe anything. Proverbs 22, verse 3, the prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. 
He's catch that there? Like the wise man, he'll see danger and he'll actually hide from it, not want to go near it. But the one who is simple, who is gullible, whose mind is just open to anything, might see it, but will continue to go on to it and will suffer. No, the Bible makes us wise so we're no longer simple and gullible. I cannot tell you how many times in, in ministry someone has said to me something along the lines of, I wish I would have listened to the word of God in this area. Or they've said to me, maybe, <laughs> I didn't even know the word of God spoke to that area. I wish I would have known. Could be college students talking about what the Bible says about God's design for sex. Man, I wish I would have known that. I wish I would have understood that. It would have saved me from a whole lot of heartache. Or maybe finances. I know one couple in our church who took our financial peace class that we offer um, on a pretty regular basis here at Grant Avenue. And they learned from the Bible what the Bible says about how we handle our finances. They said to me their entire married life, they had no idea the Bible said so much about how we handle our finances. One year after taking the class, they were completely out of debt just because they learned what the Bible said about being wise with money. Or maybe it's Sabbathing. One of the most profound things for me is when I began to read the word of God, it became wise to the need for rest. To not just go and go and go, but to rest. Not, not rest in the sense of I'm just going to sit around and watch TV all day, but rest and be with God and to grow and to recover and be refreshed and renewed. The Bible makes us wise. It's trustworthy to make us wise, not simple. You know, when you read through these verses, verse 7 and 8, you could work backwards, like the result in verse 7, reviving the soul. If your soul needs revived, what are you to do? Well, read the word of God. If you want to be wise, what are you to do? Read the word of God. Now we get to number three, and the result is rejoicing the heart. You want joy? What ought you to do? Get into the word of God. Here's the third statement that I'll make. The Bible is right Therefore, it gives you joy. It says there are the precepts. It's another word for the word of God here. The word of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord are right. That word right, it means to, be, to go straight as opposed to be bent or twisted. It's the concept of being led down a straight path. It does not lead us to places we don't want to go, but rather is, is taking us down the right path. I wrote down in my notes here, where do you look for what is right? Where do we run to figure out what is right in this world? You know, we can run to other people, and that's good. It's good to talk to other people about what might be right. We can run to other human authors, books, and read them. I was counting up on my Kindle this week. I have over 280 books now on my Kindle. <laughs> you know, there's a danger. There's a danger that we will turn to the wisdom of man before we come to the word of God. But what we're told here is that if we want to know what is right, we have to start with the word of God. Not that it's bad to get advice from friends or to go to other authors and books and uh, accumulate wisdom, but ultimately what is right is found in the word of God, and the result is rejoicing the heart. It gives joy to your heart like nothing else could. Unbelief will bring joy to your heart. Voltaire was an atheist of the most profound type, and he said this, I wish I had never been born. It's not from pleasure that we ultimately find joy. Lord Byron lived a life of pleasure, if you know anything about his life, and he wrote this, the worm, the canker, and grief, all mine alone. It's not money. Jay Gould, the American millionaire, had plenty of money, and yet when he was dying, he said this, I suppose I am the most miserable man on earth. It's not from military glory. Alexander the Great conquered the known world in his day. And having done so, he wept in his tent and said this, there are no more worlds to conquer. Where is joy found? It is found in the word of God that is right. Jeremiah said this in Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16, when your words came, I ate them. 
They were my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, O Lord God Almighty. Amidst stress and rejection and disaster, the prophet Jeremiah proclaimed, my source of joy comes from your word, and the same is true for you today. The source of joy comes from the word of God. So where do you find joy? You know, when we read the word of God, we find joy. We find joy in seeing a God who delivered his people from Egypt. We see a God who is powerful enough to cause the walls of Jericho to fall down. We see a God who sent prophets to teach and to preach to those who had never heard and yet still were rejected. We rejoice because we see the birth of a redeemer. We see the resurrection of a savior. We rejoice because we see the transformation of the apostle Paul who was once a murderer. We see the forgiveness of a prostitute. We see a king who washes feet. We rejoice because we see the promise of his return. And so I go to the Bible, whose ways are right, and I discover and I experience joy in my heart. Here's the fourth thing we're told about the word of God. The rules of the Lord are true. And right, oh, sorry, the, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And so I said this, the Bible is pure, giving light to our eyes. The commands of the Lord, they're pure. Uh, the NIV translates this as radiant. To be radiant is to give off light, make vision possible, like a sun, a candle, a lamp, a flashlight. It lights it up. So the word of God is pure. It's radiant. It's lighting up where we ought to go. It gives light to our own eyes. The Bible allows us to live our lives in the light, not in the dark. That's the benefit that we see here. It gives light to our eyes. So it reveals we're not people who are walking around in darkness. There may be great uncertainty, but the word of God, although it doesn't speak specifically to this is what you do when in quarantine in 2020, it does give us wisdom. It gives us light so we can see with clear eyes what is happening in the world around us. John Ortberg, in his book on spiritual disciplines, he asked the question, if you were deserted on an island, and you could only have one book with you, what book would you have? Now, maybe you're the ultra-religious spiritual type, and you think because we're on a church service right now, the answer should be the Bible. That's what most people might think. John Ortberg said that's what he thought that uh, G.K. Chesterton would say. He was a a very incredibly godly man, spiritual man, who wrote so many um, good, a lot of good stuff, preached in amazing ways. Uh, but when G.K. Chesterton was asked, you're deserted on an island, what book would you want to have? He did not say the Bible, which shocked John Ortberg. Instead, Chesterton chose Thomas's Guide to Practical Shipbuilding. <laughs> Isn't that true? Like, if you're, if you're stranded on a deserted island, what is it that you would want and need in that moment? Maybe not the Bible. What you'd want is a book on how to build a ship so that you can get off of that island and get back to safely, safety. We don't want to be entertained or informed of other things. We simply want this one thing that would bring about our, their, our salvation from being on the islands. And the truth is that even today where you and I are at, we are trapped in, in patterns that are destructive, behaviors that are destructive, that lead to death. And we need the word of God to bring us light. And that's what the word of God does. That's the word of God. Now, we came a long way so far. I began by saying, get into the Bible and let the Bible get into you. I just gave you a lot of good reasons. Psalm 19 gives us for us to get into the Bible, to make it a habit of reading. But I don't want this message to be about, okay, here's the challenge, church. Go read your Bible every day for 20 minutes. That's great. Go for it. Some of you do that. Some of you may not, and that's a good challenge. But I don't think it's really enough, actually, to bring about spiritual transformation for Bible reading to just be something on a checklist. Well, I just got to start reading, and all these things will happen in my life. No, no. It's not about us just getting into the Bible, but it's about the Bible getting into us. Let me just read to you four different verses really fast. Just listen to them, okay? Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. See, that's not just 
me getting into the Bible, but that's actually the Bible, the word of Christ getting into me. Let it dwell in me richly. Jesus said in Luke chapter 11, verse 28, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And there is a profound difference between just listening to the word of God and actually hearing it inside. In Joshua chapter 1, here's what God had to say to Joshua. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Meditate on it. That's the word of God getting in us. The same thing is said in Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or take a or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditate on his law day and night. There it is again, just meditate on it. Let the word of God get in to us. So then here's my question. How does this happen? How does the word of God actually get in to us and begin to transform us? I got three ideas for you, just three habits in your life that you can implement and do Um, as you read the Bible, uh, so that the Bible will get into you. Number one, and this is just straight out of Psalm and Joshua I just read, and many other places, the word is meditate. Meditate on the word of God. Now, when I talk about meditation or meditate, I'm not talking about an Eastern religion, sit crisscross and go, mmm, and something like empty your mind of all thought or something like that. That's not biblical meditation. Biblical meditation is far from that. It's actually the complete opposite. It's the filling of the mind with the word of God, with its truth, with an understanding of its meaning and application, and then taking it with us throughout the day. It was Chester. I have no doubt that what he read In the morning, as he was copying it over, now he was dwelling on it. He was meditating on it throughout the day. Let me define at least how I'll define meditation for us. It's focusing our mind on the truth. It's focusing our minds on the truth. And we know the truth is the word of God. In order to do that, you might have to eliminate distractions. You know what I can't do? I can't read my Bible on my phone. I need to read it in paper form. Here's why. Because I have my phone out, I'll be reading the Bible, trying to focus on it, and then all of a sudden I'll get a text message from one of you, or I'll get an alert on Facebook about something, uh, and I'll get distracted. If we're really going to meditate on the Word of God, even while we read it, we need to eliminate distractions. Maybe it means you have to have a scheduled time that you read. Maybe that's not something that works well for you. Maybe you need a quiet place, or maybe you actually need a place with more action going on. You work really well in a coffee shop where there's lots of things going on around you, and yet it helps you to even focus in on the Bible. You know, for a young mom, (laughs) this is almost impossible to sit down distractionless and just have, oh, 30 minutes reading the Bible. What mom has 30 minutes to just sit there and read? You know, moms, I think this, maybe the way you meditate on the word of God is just one verse that you pull out and you read it and then you begin to dwell on that. You begin to think about that. How would that apply to my life and how can I live out that today? That's good. You know, there, there might be a myth that you've bought into that if you read three chapters of the Bible a day, you are more holy than the one who read one sentence. That's not true. No, what I want to call us to is a spiritual discipline of meditating on the Word of God. So eliminate distractions. Allow yourself to to dive into it. Create space for you to focus your mind on truth. And then seek to understand. You know, if you're going to meditate on it, we got to begin to understand it. And that begins by us just asking, even praying, Holy Spirit, as I open up your word of God today, would you teach me? Reveal things to me. Reveal it in my heart. We're told the Bible's like a mirror, and so show me who I am. It might require you to get a good study Bible that has notes in it to show you maybe what things might mean or a commentary or a devotional you can read alongside. But really, it just comes down to asking one question while you read. What is God saying? Is it saying something in this passage about who God is? Am I supposed to learn something about him? Is it saying something about mankind, who I am? Am I learning something about me? 
Is it asking me to do something, respond in a certain way? What is God saying? And then meditate on that. What is it? Man, I'm learning about the awesomeness of God, or I'm learning about how a call for me to be patient, or I'm learning about how I'm created in the image of God, or the calling on my life to go and make disciples, whatever it may be, that's what I'm going to meditate on throughout the day. And then remind yourself of that. Think about that truth. Apply it. Remember, the habit we want to cultivate is not just getting into the Word, but the Word getting into us. So slow down and let the Word of God soak into you. Meditation, this is the problem. Meditation is not about you knowing more. It's about growing in relationship with God through the study of his word. But knowledge does not equal relationship. And so we begin to meditate. That's how we carry the word of God with us. That's why God said to Joshua, would you meditate on the word of God day and night? Why? It's not because he was to just constantly be reading the Bible, but that he would learn and grow from it um, and, and meditate on that all day. Here's a second spiritual discipline I want to highlight. Memorize. There may be no better way, Colossians 3.16, than to dwell on the word than to memorize it. Now, maybe when you hear the word memorization, you're kind of like, oh, maybe that's because you've been going to college for a while or you remember studying and it forced you to memorize and memorize and memorize. And the last thing you want to do is memorize anything more. (laughs) And memorization takes discipline. uh, It takes effort and time. But just think about it this way. What if I told you, For every verse you memorize in the next seven days, I will give you $1,000, every verse. (laughs) You'd probably jump at the chance, right? Oh, but look at verse 10 of Psalm chapter 19. This word of God, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. The word of God memorizes so it could dwell inside of you. Psalm chapter 119 verse 11 says this, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. How do we overcome sin? By hiding the word of God in our heart. Jesus himself, when tempted by Satan, what did he do? He quoted scripture back at Satan. That's how he fought You know the only offensive weapon given in Ephesians of the the armor of God is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's how we attack the Word of God. Memorize it. So what if you just started the habit of memorizing one verse a week? Just while you're spending time reading the Bible, something jumps out at you, and so you write it down on a little note card, and you keep it for yourself. You just kind of read through it every single day and commit it to memory. Yes, it takes a little bit of effort, but probably not as much as you think. When Dawson Trotman, he was the founder of The Navigators, incredible Christian organization existing all over the world on college campuses and different places. When he became a Christian in 1926, he committed himself to memorizing one verse of the Bible a day. At the time, he worked as a, a delivery man for... Um, uh, a lumber yard in Los Angeles. And while he would drive around town, he just memorized one verse. Three years after becoming a Christian, he had memorized 1,000 verses. If he can memorize over 300 verses a year, I bet we could memorize one verse a week. You know, Billy Graham said of Dawson Trotman that, he, that Dawson Trotman had the greatest impact on his life because of how he related to Scripture, how he had memorized it memorize it. What an incredible habit to get into of just memorizing the Word of God. Here's the third habit. Pray the Word. Pray the Word. A couple weeks ago on our Zoom meeting on a Wednesday night when we gathered as a church and we're sharing and praying with one another, I had shared that um, just the need, we see an example in Scripture of praying back Scripture. Jesus would pray passages from the Old Testament. Paul would pray passages from the Old Testament. And so you and I in our prayer life ought to pray Scripture. But I was thinking about it. What better way to let the Word of God get in us than to actually take the Word of God and just pray it back to Him? And we're just meditating on and wrestling with it. Here's the challenge, guys. Don't just get into the word, but let the word get into you. Meditate, memorize, pray it back. Let me end with an analogy from uh, a cup of tea. Now, I have never really been much of a 
tea drinker in my entire life until the last two months with COVID-19 and specifically having so many meetings on Zoom sitting across on a computer screen because I have this kind of nervous habit. I have to have something in my hand if I'm going to be sitting there talking on a computer screen with someone. And you really can't drink five or six cups of coffee in a day sitting there. So I had to cut back on the caffeine. So I started making myself tea, uncaffeinated tea that I could drink while I was talking to someone. Uh, Now, just hang with me with this analogy. So you can have your cup of hot water, and you can get that tea bag, and you could drop it in there, let's say for three seconds. One, two, three, and pull it back out. Now, if you actually watch, what you would see is that the water would begin to change color a little bit as the tea begins to permeate into the water, but it's only in there for three seconds. So when you take a sip of it, maybe there's a hint of that tea flavor, but it's not really there. But if you take that tea bag and you drop it in there and you leave it there, kind of move it around a little bit, let it permeate through the whole thing, then you can drink a good cup of tea. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing about the Word of God. The Word of God is like that tea bag, and you're like that cup of water. And you can take the Bible and you can just kind of open up and read for a second and 10 minutes and take it back out. But no, that's not, we don't, we don't want to just get into the Bible. We want the Bible to get into us. We want the Word of God to begin to permeate our lives. How do we do that? Well, we practice spiritual discipline, habits of meditating, just taking just one verse from the Bible and saying, how can I apply this to my life today? What does this mean for me today? And dwelling on that and keeping in the front of my mind. We can memorize scripture. Begin to just, what is, a, what is a verse that has been just meaningful to me? How can I memorize, commit that to my memory so when I'm in certain situations, I can recall that? Or maybe it's praying the word of God. And so as you're reading through something, man, that is so good. I just need to pray that back to God in this moment. Just keep it on the forefront of our minds. So I want to call us as a church to the habit, not just of getting into the word, but of the word getting to us. And we will begin to change. I think much like I saw change, And my friend Chester, I wish he could be here today and he could share with you. I would bring him up on stage and we would interview him and I would let him tell you about how the word of God so changed him and the word of God can change you. Wherever you're at as we wrap up, would you just pray with with your family or whoever you might be with? I'm thankful that, um, that we're able to gather today. Would you be praying for our gathering tonight of college students online? And uh, we'll see you right back here again next week. Thanks for joining us.